Maria Quaron is the director of uh, Portgate Center for Dissociation and Trauma in the UK. He is a past president of the European Society for Trauma and Dissociation and the past international direct, director of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation. Is it correct, Remy? Yeah. Sorry, hello? Yes, hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hello. <laughs> is it correct? Or I forgot? That is correct. Yes, yeah, yeah. that is correct. Yes. Okay, thank you, Remy, to be here. So, uh, as you know, uh, we are starting now to recruit patients for an epidemiological research project in different mental health centers here in Sardinia. So, uh, our um, working group, composed by psychologists and psychiatrists, in collaboration with the Italian Association for uh, the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, is going to investigate the impact of trauma and dissociation on the island. So we are going to get uh, um, psychiatric population to test how um, to evaluate the, incid the incidence of uh, and the distribu distribution of the um, trauma, cumulative traumatic experience, and, uh, and also we are going to test uh, dissociation to investigate different form of dissociation, psychoform and somatoform dissociation. Finally, another aim yes. of the research project is uh, to investigate, uh, to evaluate um, the um, correlation between uh, trauma and dissociation and uh, traumatic experience and uh, the socioeconomic variable. So this is another aim, but uh, I'm, I, I have the, the possibility to uh, um, observe, to get there, to visit you and uh, to stay in contact with you. And I'd like to ask you different questions. So uh, the first question for me is, uh, dissociative disorder as misdiagnosis. So what are the consequences for your from your perspective, and what tools do you see, do you use in your uh, assessment process to make a correct diagnosis? This is the first question I'd like to ask you. That's fine, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the problems in the UK has been, um, and I, I'm sure I'll talk a bit more about it a bit later on, but has been the fact that though, as you know, dissociative disorders have been in both psychiatric manuals for probably over 30 years, it's not been recognized um, really among, among the NHS mental health professionals. And I have to say, especially psychiatrists. Um, and psychiatrists till relatively recently have had a lot of power in deciding how someone is going to be helped and what, what psychiatric diagnosis might be given so that if they do, and many psychiatrists, even though it's in the psychiatric manuals, do not accept it. Um, and, and so they start on the basis that they're prejudiced. They're not open-minded. They already have their, 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 their determination of what might be going on, okay. So that you get people who are in distress and come for help, who will partly be disbelieved um, and I'm looking straight back at the early years. Things have changed a bit, but it still is a problem. And so, and especially if they start talking about hearing voices, then more often than not, traditionally, they were more likely to get a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And so what happens is that someone gets... The other problem is that the NHS has been very good at short-term interventions. And, and as you know, um, an attachment-based disorder like this requires the length of time to be able to form a trusting enough attachment to your therapist. So these short-term treatments, which are often cognitive rather than psychologically, emotionally attachment-based, tend to be things that people with DID um, are very good at cognition. They're very good at adjusting how they are adjusting their behavior to what they see is expected for people in authority figures. And so one of the issues to do with um, someone with a trauma history, 
which leads to dissociation is a fear of authority and always seeing authority as something destructive and that people in authority are somehow going to have their own agenda. They will use you for their own needs because that has been their experience of abuse. Um, And so they, they have this mixture. On the one hand, they try to fit in to what is wanted to be compliant. And so they might do these short term interventions, which don't work generally. Some people, it may help the stability a bit, but it doesn't process the trauma. So it makes it worse. They're re-traumatized by the fear of being in an authority system. Um, And they end up often with a whole range of diagnoses going in and out of hospital, different medications, nothing that ever actually quite fits or on very high medication for psychosis when in most cases, psychotic, antipsychotic medications don't really help. And they end up with a whole huge file of different diagnoses or different interventions. Uh, and every time it doesn't work. That's the, and so that's what happens to people uh, in that situation. The other thing just to say, and it's important for people who are entering dissociation fairly early on, that they may have a very good experience of how to work with trauma and PTSD, but the early work with dissociative clients or patients is very different. For instance, very often in the NHS, when you first go for an assessment, they want to know a detailed history Now, for someone with PTSD or maybe even complex PTSD, sometimes it's something in the short term or recently talking about help. When you have someone who has carried this since then, it could activate a destabilizing reaction so that someone starts talking about it, is triggered and is re-traumatized by it. Now, and, and so... Um, we are very, I'm very clear and people who understand about it are very clear that when you're assessing, you can talk factually about trauma if they have a factual knowledge, but you don't actually let a patient go into the emotional detail or fact, even detailed factual information because the danger is they'll go away, they'll say thank you, and then there may be a serious self-harm or even a suicide attack. Okay, okay. So, uh, Remy, I know that uh, generally um, NHS look for you for a correct diagnosis. So, uh, you, what, what kind of tools do you use in your own private practice to, to, um, yes, to assess DID or dissociative disorders in general? First of all, the first thing we do is... Um, We deal with people both from the NHS who come and make um, inquiries, but a lot of the inquiries begin by individuals who think they may have this condition or who have heard about us, who ask if if we can help. And so the, the first thing we do is we send the two screening instruments that we use. One is the DS, Associative Experience, um, which has got 28 questions. And the other one is the SDQ20, which is one that looks at more the, the somatic, the, the, the non-verbal um, reactions to living with dissociation. Now these self-screening instruments are using the questions, if you look at them, are a language that is both trying not to stigmatize them but at the same time may bringing up in the language the first time questions that they've never been asked. Um, And suddenly they, even though it may be difficult for some, they begin to say that to themselves, that if that question is there, like, do you ever find things that obviously belong to you, but you have no memory of having ever bought them, or do you find sometimes, um, that you find yourself in a place and you have no idea how you got them there, um, makes them realize that this does exist, 
they're not alone in this. And so this is the beginning of getting them to really begin to focus that this may well be and there's not being crazy or, or psychotic. Um, now, the DES, the important about the DES is that it has a DES taxon, which means you can use a software to determine very accurately whether or not someone is likely to have a dissociative disorder if they do the full assessment. So both screening instruments can give a good indication of the likelihood. Now, what we do, and I encourage other people to do, um, is always to send these out without charging for it. So people send it back. We send them a letter outlining the results as well as the pedigree, you know, the research that's gone into both those screening instruments. And this may be something that they may want to give to their GP. They may want to show to their colleagues, I mean, to their uh, partners or their friends, or they may even show to the psychiatrist. And what is certain is that even it's, it's a paper trail. It's what we call a paper trail. So if you've got professionals that don't believe you, it has to be in their notes if that's been sent and asked to be there. So it may stay there for a few years, but there's a chance that later on it'll be picked up. So that's the most important thing. And then from then, we then, um, the, only screen, the only main assessment tool I use is the SCID-D. Um, that's the Structural Clinical Interview for DSM-4, it has been dissociative disorders. Uh, Marlene Steinberg, who is the originator of the this is nearly finishing her DSM-5 version, which will be um, the importance of this one is it's not like assessments of normal psy psychiatric and psychological condition. It, it's looking at nonverbal signals. Someone may say who's got a dissociative disorder may say, yes, I agree with you completely, or no, I don't agree with you, or have body movements at the same time. Those are as important as the and it's to try and open up the conversation. And if someone knows how to use them, it's a very good therapeutic tool in itself to begin to open up someone's world without talking, not needing to talk any about the trauma. All of this is looking at how someone is experiencing life from day to day. Okay. Now, I think you've frozen for the moment, Costanzo. Yeah. I'm just yeah. telling you that. So yeah. I don't know if you've heard all of that. Do, do you see me, Remy? Yeah. Okay. Do you see me? Because yes. the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The connection connection is not so. I know you froze little... for a bit, but I don't know if you heard everything I said. But that, that's yeah, that's yeah, fine. yeah. I was yeah, hearing. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just the last uh, okay. concept, for Remy. If you can, if you can repeat the last uh, aspect. You say that uh, is very important because uh, what you what you were saying. I can't remember which bit, but anyhow, yeah. I may be repeating. It's very important because, first of all, it's a therapeutic relationship. Uh, it has a therapeutic role. And also, um, it looks at the nonverbal signals as well as the verbal ones. Um, and it begins, it is, what's very important, I remember now, is that it's not looking at past trauma. It is okay. looking at how people's lives are now, what, you know, do they find themselves in a place without knowing how they got there? Do they, do they lose time? Do they sometimes see themselves looking down, you know, all the, uh, on themselves uh, as though they are watching a video of themselves. These are looking at things that are happening in their everyday life. That is enough, okay. plus the nonverbal signals to be able to tick the necessary boxes to be able to score it. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Remy. Yeah. So, Remy, uh, move on with the second question for you. I want to ask you more about yes. your, uh, your personal experience in the UK. How long have you been working on trauma and dissociation? And what kind of uh, difficulties have you met all along the way in informing about dissociative disorders? Um. I first came across my first dissociative client uh, back in 1989 um, when I had finished my psychoanalytic training in London. And, you know, when you do a training, you come back and you think all your patients or clients are going to fit in what you've learned. And, of course, someone came along 
um, and was completely didn't fit in at all. Nothing that I was thought would be there would be there. Um, and so I then tried to, luckily she was someone high functioning um, who also knew quite a lot about her condition. She, it wasn't hidden up in the same way that it sometimes is. And so I started learning a bit from her and I also then joined ISSTD uh, and went to all their conferences for a while because there was nothing uh, that I knew about existed in this field in the UK at all. It, it, it helped that um, my background is quite mixed in terms of a French mother, an Italian grandfather, um, living in Holland, going to boarding school in England, uh, being born in the States. So traveling a lot with my parents, uh, who was working for the UN in Holland. And so that got me used to understanding the different cultures from an early age and knowing how to adapt in a way. And going to boarding school is having to adapt. So I, I always think looking back, you have frozen again, just to tell you. So. No, no, now, now you're okay. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. You can continue. Did you hear all that? Yeah, okay. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, I, you know, going to boarding school is, is, a, is a sort of dissociative reaction um, in terms of I had to adjust from being in a very French emotional family in Holland to going to England to a very formal, stiff <laughs> people in authority who would you know, bow their heads, didn't even shake your hand in the, in the school when I first went there. So I learned to adjust, and I think that probably helped. Um, but there was no acceptance of it there. And there was, the, the other thing I learned is that there was a real split between the work done within the public sector, the NHS, and the work done in the private and voluntary sector. And I learned that actually most of the work that was done um, to do with trauma and dissociation in those days was actually in the, in the private and voluntary sector. Um, they accepted it much more quickly. The notion that someone was coming with their internal world, they didn't question it, they just worked with it. Um, and I think this split historically has been very difficult to change so that the NHS saw these private therapists as they're having, it's like a hobby. They don't have to take responsibility for the whole of that person and put them into hospital and give them psychiatric medication. Um, whereas the private sector were not good at understanding the complexity of organizations. They tend to work on their own and they tend to have, so they're positive things and negative things. The positive thing of being in an organization like the NHS is you're, you're, you're backed, you're supported by a whole team. Mm -hmm. and you don't feel isolated. You work privately, which was a lot of the work that was privately, that you tend to become like, like hostages with your patient or your client, just the two of you trying to battle with the world out there that the NHS that didn't understand what was going on. And there have still been problems about that because most people who work privately uh, don't understand or really like the idea of organizations. Now, what I, my background is business before I trained. And so I understood about, about businesses. And so what I realized is that in order to be accepted, I wasn't a medical, I've got no medical background, uh, other psychoanalysis, not medical background. Um, I had to learn their language. Um, just as we as uh, therapists have to learn the language of our clients. I had to learn the language of the NHS, which is why I then decided I must learn about these, these instruments. I must learn about the screening instruments. I must learn about the SCID-D because the SCID-D then is more likely to be, because it's a medical model in America, so it's more likely to be accepted. And so I went to Holland and learned about that. Um, and very slowly, um, I did some supervision uh, in my local hospital of therapists and um, nurses. Um, and I wouldn't use the word dissociation to begin with because no one understood that or they might push it away. I talk about different reactions to different people. And there was one time two, a, a nurse and a, and a psychologist in, in the supervision group I was running. And they both were dealing 
with the same patient. And one said, the nurse said, she's a waste of time. She's just pretending she shouldn't be in hospital. Um, she's winding people up. She's attention seeking. And the, and the psychologist says, you don't understand. I see her in the corner crying. She is in big distress. And so I could begin to say, this is the same person. The problem is not you two. You're just seeing two different aspects of the same person. Um, and, and in a way, slowly it developed from there because I then started um, educating in a, in a non-defensive way, very carefully trying to encourage uh, the local trust um, to accept that they may be a very small cluster of people, but they were still important to deal with. And I think that's how it developed. Now, the difficulties have been most of the NHS trusts nationally um, didn't know anything about it, didn't um, accept it. Um, unless there was, and what would change it is if someone had the backing of their family or a very good friend and were willing to challenge and threaten to take a court action. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly the money was there because NHS trusts don't want to be they got taken to court. Money was there to try and see, could they try and be assessed and see if there was another way in. And so it would start with one patient and then you'd find the same trust might have other patients who psychologists were working with, but they'd never put the word dissociation in, into the diagnosis. Uh, the, the reason why it begins to change is because actually it's very expensive for an organization like the NHS to misdiagnose because someone is always back again, going into hospital, lots of visits to the GP, um, unexplained body illnesses, which no exploration will see a physical cause. Uh, sometimes the police are involved because someone's lost. Um, so you begin, you begin to see that if they see the money is an expensive way, people begin, they began to see that if they could get the right place, the right therapy in place, um, it actually costs less. Now, Mike Lloyd, I don't know, did you come across Mike Lloyd? I yeah, know. yeah, I know. He did a study to demonstrate with one patient that it was that before she started the right treatment, she had, it cost a lot of money for the NHS. They had so many people involved in these disciplinary, multidisciplinary teams, these these teams, everybody being involved in different ways, when, when the therapy that is expensive and, and takes three to four years to really get somewhere, all of that began to reduce. Um, and, and that's been a big help as well. I don't know if that answers you um, enough, that question. Or, or yeah, not. yeah. Uh, no, the last question, Remy, is connected to this one, is... Uh, how, how the situation, you are describing the situation at the present uh, or, or something has changed during the last uh, 10, 20 years from your point of view in the treatment, obviously in the treatment too. Okay, okay. I mean, it's very interesting because I should think in the last five to seven years, things have really begun to change. Now that's because... Uh, from a lot of people's involvement. One thing that really has helped, uh, you will know about this, is Costanzo is the first person plural, which yeah. is an organization of survivors. Now, professionals may not accept our reports from other professions. They may, but when you see someone like some of the people at this organization, first person plural, talking about the experience in a very rational, in a very articulate way, they don't find it possible to say that's nonsense. They have to begin to accept it because it's coming from the patient themselves. Now, I always say in therapy, it has to be a partnership anyhow between the patient and the therapist. Uh, and the same applies with the NHS, is learning to be partners with this adult. As like Symbolically, like you're one parent, the patient is the other adult patient, and then you're looking to help them your patient begin to be the parent to their own inner world of, of um, trauma, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. Remy, um, related to this question, I'd like to ask you 
um, something if if you want to tell us something about the first person plural what the history of this association because it's a very interesting uh, work here in the UK. I, I, yeah. I would say it's probably the one thing that in England we've probably developed, I think, more than most other European countries, right from early on. Um, and that was thanks to um, a group of probably about three of us clinicians and also uh, an organization that existed um, to support other people who are living with this condition. Um, and Two of them um, I knew very well, and, and one of them had, had been through therapy and had um, really resolved most of her issues. She was um, very much had, had integrated a lot of her, her way of dealing with life. And we began uh, as, 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 a, a, as, a, as a, sorry, the UK branch of ESTD began to develop trainings that all trainings would be in partnership with first person plural. So that all trainings we have done has been the clinicians and one or two members of first person plural. Um, that has helped because to for someone learning to learn it both from the patient, like how, that's how we learn as therapists, it is also from the patient, but as trainings, they're training there as well as also clinicians training there. So people get the understanding of it from both living with it, but also from clinicians' knowledge. Now, we do that in talks we give to professionals. We do that. So, and that has sort of also um, taken away some of the stigma because one of the problems that used to exist in England and is getting better is that the professionals are the, are the gods. They know what to do. You just do what we tell you and follow our advice or our treatment or our diagnosis or our medication and you'll be all right. Now, yeah. when someone has been brought up being told what to do by, by the adults or the parent or whoever, you do other tubes. If you don't do it, I'll hit you or whatever. That doesn't change anything. That just repeats the same power inequality. Now, that doesn't mean that as therapists, we haven't got power. We have got power and we have to have power, but you have to be real and responsible and not abuse it. And, and unfortunately, that still happens, not necessarily on purpose, but this idea is we are the gods, the professionals, and you are there coming for help. And that's, that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I completely agree with you, obviously about this, this concept. And I think that um, this is uh, the main aspect we, we have to try to change in the relationship between uh, uh, clinicians and patients. Just to have a cooperative uh, motivational system activated or try to activate that, That's absolutely right. That, that's absolutely right. And, and the sort of curiosity and, and in, you know, to be interested in the person so that they can begin to start talking about things that they might be interested in, which they never had a chance to do as a child. Because when you start receiving trauma of some sort, the first thing you go is that energy, that saying why as a child. You know, Charles keeps saying, why, why, tell me why, to the point as a parent, sometimes you say, that's enough. But all of that goes. No one, they don't say why anymore. You just wait to see what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So you have to have that, that energy there. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much, Remy, for uh, your uh, contribution. And uh, we hope uh, to change something in the treatment of uh, trauma-related disorder. <laughs> okay. uh, you're very welcome. <laughs> you're very welcome. Okay. Thank you.